Earth science time. Today we're talking about um, surface features. Including what? Well, you guys did the part of the reason that we have the that I had you do the exploration of the self-check before this is so that you can answer questions like that. Including what? Or what are some surface features? Um. And we're talking about large-scale surface features here, primarily. Yeah, mountains. So mountains. Yeah, mountain ranges. Mountains and valleys, obviously, are included within that. And then uh, rifts. All right, we're going to include, these are not necessarily large scale features, but folds and faults. And this is going to initiate our discussion about this other uh, phenomenon on our surface, which is extremely important. So we're going to have this box over here. I'm going to label it plate. I should have made you answer this. Tectonics. Let's, let's, you should already know, but let's define plate tectonics real briefly. In our first order of instructional business here. What is plate tectonics? Okay, yeah, but this is a different thing. This is plate tectonics, which itself, this, the... Is the theory? Okay, yes, there you go. It's a theory, which remind me what a theory is, because we've talked about this before, but I don't want there to be confusion when we watch the video. What's a theory? Because if I say, Oh, I have a theory that it'll rain tonight. Do I mean theory in, sci in a scientific way? No, obviously. I probably mean guess, or maybe even, if I'm being generous, hypothesis. But a scientific theory is, is an idea. Mm -hmm. it, it, has started out by, it, it has started out as a hypothesis, but then it has what we call a preponderance of evidence. It has all of the evidence. All the evidence that exists fits into this theory. And if it doesn't, like if there's a new piece of evidence discovered that doesn't fit, what do we do? We change it. Change the theory. Yeah, exactly right. So this is an idea backed up by evidence. All the evidence, in fact. So it's, it's the best explanation we have that contains all the evidence. Anyway, this is the, the plate tectonics theory is the theory that, what? Finish that theory. thought. Let's start with the verb. What, what does it mainly deal with? What verb is happening here because of movement? Yeah, theory that what, what moves now? The crust. Yeah, yeah the, the, the crust, the Earth's crust, and really we could say the crust of any planet on which this occurs. There's not plate tectonics on every celestial body, but on those where there are plate tectonics, that body's crust is segmented, is segmented, and those segments move. Why? Due to mm, no, I mean at, the, at its core, or at its core, I shouldn't say things like that because the Earth has a core. Um, at the very heart of it, yeah, gravity is what's providing the energy on a on a large scale. And that's not the only thing. There's also nuclear fission that provides. Um, a lar energy on the large scale, but what what is the? Hey, Mr. Um, the the energy is due to. Well, here let's draw our, let's draw a, draw a little diagram of planet Earth. Um, so let, let's draw our little diagram of planet Earth here. I I do it in black because my purple was dying, but now the black is also dying, so that was kind of useless. I'm going from the in, from the outside in. What? Well, if I was really going from like outer space, and what should I have drawn first? Like if I'm in a hole that's also going to drill into Earth all the way through, well, you know that thing, that thing we call a missile drill. If I'm in that and I'm going into Earth, what am I, is what the first thing I'm going to hit? The atmosphere. Okay, and then this, what I've just drawn is the... The surface of Earth? Yes, and we call that specifically... The biosphere? Uh, maybe. There might be a biosphere in the way. I like if I'm getting through someone's lawn or someone's house or ant colony. Yeah, I'm talking about the crust, yeah. And, and we're going to talk about this in two ways. So first we're going to talk about this is the crust. And then beneath the crust, as I keep drilling in with my missile drill, what do I encounter next? The mantle. I'm going to label this layer here the mantle. And then be, beneath that is the, 
Oops, the inner core is on the outside. <laughs> oh, okay, good. The outer core, and this is not to scale. And then, and then in the inside is the inner core. Okay, and that's one way. That's the way you learned in what? Most recently, eighth grade, but before that, sixth grade, and before that, third grade, and whatever. Um, but there's another way that we commonly talk about this, which is that I'm going to do this in one purple, which is, as we said before, still dying. Um, Another way that we usually talk about this is, to, I'm going to draw in purple here, that the crust itself and the top part of the mantle that is solid, we together call the lithosphere. And this is, this may not be a new word. Did we talk about this when you were in eighth grade? The, the word lithosphere? We talked this about it like a couple, a couple of, of Okay, yeah, with the lithosphere. But have you heard this other word, um, which we call the rest of the mantle, this, this, uh, what we call plastic part. It's not made of the material plastic, but plastic meaning that it's, Soft but moldable, and we call that the asthenosphere. Do you remember that? Yep. Asthenosphere. Lithos is the Greek word for, you remember? No. no, that's the word for rock or stone. And then sphere obviously is sphere. And then the asthenosphere, the asthenos is the Greek word for weak. Which it means like structurally weak, like it's able to be moved without any firm placement. So um, we have these two kind of, uh, and they're not contradicting ideas, they're just different ways of looking at planet Earth that we use in different um, situations. When we're talking about plate tectonics, it's really not the crust that's segmented, it's the lithosphere. And the, the mantle is not what's convecting we're going to talk about convection in a second, but the asthenosphere is what convects, and it moves the lithosphere along with it relative to other plates. So the Earth's lithosphere is segmented. And is the lithosphere the same crust? No. no, but the lithosphere does contain the crust. Remember, the lithosphere is the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle that is solid. And then the asthenosphere is the weak or plastic under part of the mantle. And then the, the, in this second model with the purple, the outer core are still just as they are in the first model. This has come up on TikTok recently. I saw or recently here being last year. Um, how do we know this is true, do you reckon? What evidence is there that this is true? Someone thought of it was neat, and so now I draw it on my whiteboard every year. What do you think is the evidence for this? Well, what isn't the evidence? Like, what hasn't happened? Okay, there you go. Yeah, we, we can't directly observe it. So we can't have direct evidence. So it, we can't know it in the same way that I know that Camden's shirt is purple because I'm literally looking at Camden's purple. So I can't know it like that. I can't saw the earth in half and make this model happen in real life. So what, what evidence could we have? And is that as good? Well, what the evidence that we do have is from seismic activity. And so there will be um, different seismic stations all over planet. So like pretend there's one there and one there. And what we see is that if there's a natural earthquake maybe, that has that separate center there, and the waves, as you know, travel out. Um, the S waves can't travel through a liquid. And so we, we see them, or we detect them in other, all over the world there are these seismic stations, and we would not detect these S waves, which tells us there's something fluid in between. And that's the asthenosphere. So that's one piece of evidence. Um, and then also we can also produce our own minor earthquakes. There, there are machines that geologists use that all they do is just pound the ground really hard and that makes a seismic shock which effectively has the same, uh, gives the same readout as like sonar. So they basically use a seismic wave as sonar to tell what's under the ground which is useful and interesting. And is that as good as my just being able to say, oh Camden Street is purple. Is that as good an evidence? Camden says no. Camden says I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Kyla, I'll let him know. I'll write him a letter. I'll say, Dear Geology, Kyla thinks this is okay. What, Camden? I want to hear your thought. It's okay. Well, so obviously we can't just see it. No. But is seeing everything? I mean, do, can I know everything about your shirt just from seeing it? No. no. I don't know what it feels like. I probably will never know what it feels like, and that's fine, because it's not part of the evidence I can collect. In the same way, will I know what this literally looks like? No, because I can't go down there. But I do know some stuff about that I couldn't know just by looking at it. You know, I know the, the physical properties of this, the density and stuff that I couldn't know just by looking at it. So there's a give and take for evidence. But a lot, we have there's this misconception. The reason I brought up TikTok is because I saw a TikTok that says, this is um, person, and they say, I just found out yesterday that we don't actually know if this is true because it's all, it's all based on seismic activity. And she, 
this person, I, sh I don't need to mention her sex or gender, but this person, uh, the person sex or gender, gosh darn it. Uh, well, okay, I am, I'm a misogynist. No, um, do you know what that word means? It means someone who hates women, and I'm not. I just accidentally brought up. This is going on YouTube. They're this is going on, yeah, they're, they're, the comments are disabled for this video. Uh, misogyny is not a sponsor. Anyway, the, um, this person brought up that we don't have that we don't know this is true because no one's seen it. And so on the one hand, the person is, is right because we haven't seen it. But on the other hand, in a much more real way, the person is not right because we do have evidence. And this evidence is at least as good as being able to see it. You know, like maybe we can't see with our own eyes, but that's kind of like a modern era Facebook way of looking at evidence. Like it's not really, that's not what's really important. People will say, oh, I've never seen planet Earth being round, so I don't think it is. That's not how evidence works. I mean, there's really good evidence. It's not your eyesight. But there's good evidence that it is that way if you um, know what you're looking at and you're not an idiot, basically. Sorry, at, at TikTok user 1234, I don't know what the person's... I, I'm going to start over. I don't know what their handle is. I know it's not Aeropatra 4 oxide because that's mine. Anyway, cabinet, what do you need? Yeah. Right, exactly. There's, there's evidence that there, there, there were dinosaurs, and we talk about this a lot in 8th grade. Um, some of the 8th graders have wild ideas about whether or not Helen Keller is real, et, et cetera. Um, so anyway, the, all of this we understand to be true, and that's what makes it a theory. Is that the evidence all supports this idea, this explanation of the way things are. And that leads us to, what, what's special about in here? My, all my markers are dead at the same time. What's special in here? I'm pointing at the inner core. That's really hot. It's really hot. That's special. <laughs> it's hotter than the surface of the sun. And what that causes is just in the same way, like if we look at this column of, this vast column of rock here, it's almost like, uh, I'm going to have to invade my notes area over here. It's almost like we have a beaker of water and there's a hot plate on the bottom. This is, I'm using this because it's something we can relate to. Hot hot. There's the hot plate. Um, now that the hot plate here represents the inner core. What does the water in the beaker represent? Um, the outer no. Sure, maybe. It doesn't matter. The hot plate is the core. What does the water in the beaker represent? The or yeah, the mantle or what we call the asthenus. I'm going to label it asthenus here. I'm not going to label it asthenus here because I'm not going to have enough room to draw my little arrows. Whoop. But in my example, this is the assistance here. So this is the beaker here. This all is hot plate. This is a good drawing. I'm good at science. Um, what happens when the water gets hot? It bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. It, it, what we should say is it becomes less dense, and it does do that. When things get hot, they expand, but the amount of matter hasn't changed, and so the mass doesn't change, but the volume has gotten bigger. And because rho equals m over v, if density can't change, and the volume is getting bigger, I'm sorry, the density can't change. The mass can't change, the volume is getting bigger, then the density must get smaller. And what do we know about den less dense things compared to more dense things? They do, which one is it? Because there's an actual answer. Yeah, less dense things float. And so the water down here. Convection, good, shortcut. Okay, can takes regard. Anyway, by the way, it also when it gets up here, it's cooler, and so it cools down, contracts, and then sinks. But this is happening in the asthenosphere, and if we have a, I don't know, a raft up here made of saltine crackers or something. I don't don't, don't at me. Um, and there's little people in their houses and stuff on here. As the convection occurs, these move, and that is that's the theory of plate tectonics in a model. So how does that have to do with any of this? Well, actually, all of this is like, I think this is unit six, which we are going to eventually do, and so that'll be, we'll have a shortcut then. I think it's unit six. Yeah, it is. Um, but what does that have to do with any of this? That the plate tectonics causes. Right, yes. right. It, specifically in two processes. And plate tectonics themselves cause other features. Um, themselves, the, itself, they do. It really do be that way, whatever. Um, these things are caused by uplift and subsidence.
the best way, or the way that I like to think about this, is um, we can have uplift in a couple of different ways, but the, the main ways that plates can interact are, we're just going to do a brief rundown of this because this has to do with plate tectonics, um, convergence, divergence, Um, I'm going to draw up and down arrows on this, but that's transform. These are types of plate boundaries. So where two plates meet, where two pieces of the lithosphere meet, they can do one of these three things. And when it's convergent or divergent, both of these can cause different features to form. So it's obvious to us that mountains can form. Um, if we have two plates that are coming together, something has to give, basically. Um, even if I have two pieces of paper coming together, this is the example I usually give. If I have two pieces of paper coming together, something the paper crumples up. And that's all uh, mountain, mini mountain ranges are, is what we call crumple zone mountains. Crumple zone mountains can form. And then rifts can occur when there's divergence, when the, basically a big hole forms and stuff falls down into it. And that would be an example of subsidence. So the, the first one, the mountain range forming through plate tectonics would be a, like crumple zone mountains. And then subsidence might be if uh, rift valley forms, valley formation. And then all of them can be associated with these folds and faults. What's the difference between a fold and a fault? Those are vocab words, so you should know. You remember? Well, I'll tell you because you don't remember. Um, folds happen when the rock deforms but does not break, and then folds happen when it does break. So folds are deformation without breaking, and these are both large scale activities. And I'll just put breakage when the rock breaks due to these stresses. And the kinds of stress are compression, tension, and shear. Um, let me get a piece of paper to demonstrate these. And, and I do want you to write these down. I'll use someone's artwork. This will be great. D Dally won't mind. Um, it's on YouTube, so it's kind of like it's kind of like I'm not actually going to destroy it because I'm making something out of it. Ooh, that's beautiful. At Dally Anders. I don't know what her twiddle, twiddle handler, uh, Twitter handle. Um, the three kinds of stress are compression, tension, and shear. And this is general. This is true of canvas, geology, or plate tectonics. So if I have a thing, you guys see the thing I have? Yeah. Hey, you see the thing? Compression stress is if I push on it from both sides. That's compression stress. Compression. And then shear stress, or sorry, tension stress is if I pull on it, which doesn't really do anything for the paper. And these ha this has different kinds of strength. Um, remember, asthenus means weak, but this has different kinds of strength in the same way that the asthenus sphere is weak. This can be strong tensionally. Like, I can pull it really as hard as I can, and I cannot just tear it apart. You know, it has high tensile strength. Does it have high compressional strength? No, it takes almost nothing to compress it. I mean, really, if, I, if I'm getting right down to it, it probably does actually have comp high compressional strength, but I'm able to fold it because it can deform like that. And the other one is shear, which is this. That's shear stress. Sorry, Dally. Um, but shear is when there's one going one way and one going the other way. That's shear stress. And those kinds of stress relate to these kinds of plate boundaries. So convergence, obviously, is mostly what kind of stress? Did you write them down like I asked you? Not shear. Did you write them down? OK, well, once again, write them down. Compressional. Compressional, a convergent plate boundary would be mostly compressional stress. A divergent plate boundary would be mostly tensional stress or tension stress. And the transform plate boundary is probably mostly a shear stress. Sorry, Dolly. We're going to talk about two more things, and I don't have illusions that this is everything. In fact, I would call this more of a supplement. I hope you have also read your explorations because that's important. Um, know all the vocab words, but I want to talk about two more things specifically. The first one is faulting. 
fault, well, let's at least spell it right, types, there we go, fault types. Mm, let me draw it more like that. Mm, and this one I want to draw more like, well, I, might, I might as well draw it like that, although they don't have to be. Three-dimensional, wow, look at the art. Thanks, Camden. What is going on? I'm choosing a million different ways to draw these things. That's okay. Um, the reason I've drawn them at angles, and if I might add quite badly at angles, is that uh, it really depends on uh, which way these move. And I have example blocks of this, but I sh if I had been thinking about it, I would have grabbed them before the video, but I didn't. Um, but if you imagine these blocks as they are, if I push them together, what kind of stress is that, first of all? That is compression. compressional stress. If I push them together, what's going to happen here? If we imagine these are real blocks, what's going to happen if I push them together? They're going to push against each other, yeah. Maybe I'm not giving you enough information. In, in, each, in the first two cases, one of these blocks will move up and the other will move down. Um, and so, if I look at this one, the compressional one, uh, will move up. The overhanging block or the non-overhanging block? Your book calls them foot wall and hanging wall. Will the hanging wall hang in? I'm just going to put hang in until I ran out of room. There's enough room. I just like hang in. Hanging wall and foot wall. Which one will move up? If I compress them together... Try again. The hanging, the hanging wall. wall. You got it. The hanging wall moves up in compressional stress. The foot wall moves down. Okay, so what if I have them move apart? This would have been easier now that I think about it if I got the blocks. Stand by. I'll go get the... I got the blocks. Here are the blocks. So Yeah, they used to live up there. Yeah. Don't talk about any of the stuff on that shelf. Um, if I push them together, hanging wall slides up. If I pull them apart, it's kind of hard to tell, but like I, if I pull them apart, they just come apart. But if I don't put pressure on them, I let them fall, you can see the foot wall. I should have said that. The foot wall doesn't move up. The hanging wall starts to move down. So that's what happens in this one. The hanging wall starts to move down, and the foot wall moves up, relatively. And then the last type, they just slide past each other laterally like this. Check it out. So, and they have names. This one's called normal fault. The faults themselves. Like this kind of fault is called a normal fault. This kind of fault is called a reverse fault. And this kind of fault is called a strike slip fault. Normal fault, oh, compressional. Reverse fault, tensional. Strike slip fault. The earth! The shear. Questions about that? Okay, and then the last thing. Hold on. Let me get to the page. Is isostatic equilibrium. I'm going to erase this because it's the first thing, so I assume that you have it done. How deep do a mountain's roots go? Something about the Hobbit. I don't know. You guys know the Hobbit? Yeah. Here's my shoebox full of red water. You know about shoebox full of red water. Imagine if I have a cork, a fairly large cork, bobbing in the shoebox full of red water. I drew it this way specifically because about half of it is still going to be under the water, and about half of it's going to be above the water. And if I push it down, what is it? Because of what force? Do you remember from, from physical science? What force is going to push it back up? It will go back up, but what force is that? Let's start with an easier one. If I pull it up out of the water and I let go, what's going to happen? Gravity is pulling it down. What force is buoying it up? F 
sub g, gravity. The force buoying it up is the buoyant force, f sub b, the buoyant force. It's the same thing with mountains. If I have, if I have my plate on my asthenosphere, the mountain is going to be roughly, as the lithosphere goes, as far down under into the asthenosphere as it is up above. Um, and if uplift causes it, or if convergent plate boundaries cause it to uplift more, it also crumbles it down beneath for one thing, but the whole thing will sink or raise up depending on this balance between the buoyant force and the gravitational force. And this is called isostatic, there's only one eye, well, I mean, there's two eyes in the word, but there's not, just write it down, isostatic equilibrium. Equilibrium meaning that these two forces are balanced together. They're equal to each other, but in opposite directions. And isostatic, meaning it stays put. The root word of this is stay. Iso means same, stay, and they're equal. And that sounds like three of the same word over and over again. But basically it means that this mountain is going to, because of the forces acting on it, will about as much above and below the lithospheric geodesic. And what, what makes this interesting is that as a mountain erodes, well, and that's one thing that kind of relates the last chapter to this one, or the last lesson to this one, as erosion occurs over time, generally mountains get what in general? Smaller. smaller, yeah. Mountain ranges get smaller because erosion. But also, the isostatic equilibrium changes. As they're eroded away, their mass decreases, and so the force of gravity acting on them decreases, and so they actually lift up. So. To some extent, even as they erode, mountains continually uplift. And that's kind of a more subtle version of uplift than the collision of plates. But the, it counteracts the effects of erosion. Oh, well, there was like a, there was actually a question on our lesson, so I'll check about it. Oh. And it was saying how, like, because of the buoyant force, like, the force of gravity acting on it, it would be like, it would like, There's a there's an evening out. This is what's called, and we just talked about positive feedbacks this morning, in yeah, or positive that's feedback what loops. Positive and negative and feedback this is a, these both are negative feedback loops because as the compressional stress builds, the mountain gets taller and taller and larger and larger, and this little pile in the middle here gets stronger in both directions. But also gravity affects it more strongly, and so it sinks. And then as it erodes, the mountain itself is being worn away, obviously, so it's getting shorter. But the gravitational force is decreasing, and so it's buoyed back up. And so that's a negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loop meaning the bigger it gets, the less it gets bigger. The smaller it gets, the less it gets smaller. And the positive feedback loop would be something like the examples that I gave this morning were like um, snowball earth, where the colder it got, the more ice there was, and that caused the sunlight to be reflected, which means it got colder. And then the colder it got then, the more sunlight was reflected, and it got colder, and colder, and colder, and colder. That's a positive feedback loop. Anyway, do you have questions about any of this? We talked about fault types. We talked about isostatic equilibrium. We talked about plate boundaries. And we talked about plate tectonics in general. This, this little box over here is basically, because of the way we did it, I went to unit 7 after unit 3. And unit 6 is plate tectonics. But this is unit 6 in a nutshell. Everything you'll need for this test is here. Do you have questions about any of it? OK. Bye. Bye.